Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning worship experience of the Gilfield Baptist Church located in Petersburg, Virginia. We're so delighted to have you worship with us by whatever social media platform that you're using. We pray that today's worship experience will be a blessing to you. If you'd like to give an offering in support of this ministry, then text us at 73256 and key in the message GBC Give. Now may the music and the message minister to our hearts.
God for the Ministry of Music for their leading us in praise to our God. I'm excited and I want to dive right into today's message. I want you to turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 4, and I want to start at verse 17. It's dropped in my spirit for a few days ago, and I want to share that with you. Just my observations. Genesis chapter 4, verse 17, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. It reads this way. And Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enosh. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enosh after the name of his son. Now, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. I'll read it again. And Cain had relations with his wife. Stop. This passage comes right after Cain has denied killing his brother Abel. Yes, it's the Cain whose parents were Adam and Eve, the first couple mentioned in scripture. He had a brother, Abel. He kills his brother and then denies it and he gives the now famous or infamous quote, am I my brother's keeper? Well, of course, God knows the whole story and sentences him to exile. He leaves his home, he leaves his family, his family of origin that is, and he goes to a place called Nod. And God gives him this benefit, this grace, that no one had better not take his life, called the mark of Cain, meaning nobody can kill or harm him unless they deal with God. But because of Cain's act of violence, murdering his brother Abel, he's exiled, banished from his family of origin. We'll deal with that a little later. I was looking over some notes that I had made almost 30 years ago. They were in my vault. This passage under a heading for a sermon series, All in the Family or Family Matters. But more importantly, over the last 30 years of ministry, I realized that all of those sermon notes in my sermon vault reflect what the church didn't always tell us. Maybe, maybe the church forgot. So I want to introduce a little intermittent series called Things the Church Forgot to Tell Us. And I want to go back and make sure that you and I never can say that again because I'm going to remember to tell you. And in this family situation, I was caught on the first part of verse 17. I've forgotten. Cain had a wife. I thought back a few days ago, who performed his ceremony? Cain had a wife. And then the thought came to me, did she know about his... Uh, his past, especially his anger issues. And scripture does not suggest that he went into any kind of therapy, that he went through any program of counseling, any kind of psychological or psychiatric help in order to deal with this very traumatic experience. He murders his brother. We're not really told why, but we can reasonably su suspect that it was rage, anger, jealousy. But Cain was married. I've been officiating wedding ceremonies now for uh, 29 years. Used to keep track of how those couples were doing, but it grew and of course the pandemic has just kind of disconnected a lot of people, some successful and some not so successful in those 29 years. But I really thought about this passage of scripture again. Cain had a wife. 
Now, of course, I was thinking in our modern day context that someone officiated and that the couple went to the city hall or the courthouse and they paid for a license and they brought the license to the officiant who performed the ceremony and signed it. And I'm using that, but still, the Bible says he had a wife. They lived together. And from verse 17, they kind of lived, at least in verse 17, kind of happily. But did she know about his anger issues? Scripture does not tell her us her name. We don't know anything about her except she had a son named Enosh. No, not the one who walked with God. This is a different Enosh, but the name obviously was popular, who has a city named after him. His name, by the way, Enosh, means dedicated. Wow. Cain, who kills his brother, is exiled, marries, lives in Nod, and then names the city after their first son. And that means dedicated, committed. And I begin to think about all of the people, church people, who have whatever opinions or feelings about marriage. And sadly, we've made that a political discussion and not a theological discussion. We've not even consulted the Bible. But be that as it may, I wanna to talk to and engage some church folk. I've been a Baptist all of my church life. So whoever it is, if you're an officiant, that you do marry, who comes before you, whatever that's like, this is still gonna benefit you. And if you are the family member of somebody who wants to get married, and especially if you're gonna spring for all or some of the expense, I, I want you to listen in. And just, I wanna remember to tell you that the ceremony is fine. Who you choose to officiate the ceremony, and whose ceremony you choose to officiate, hey, that's on you. You're free to do whatever the laws in your jurisdiction allow you to do. And whatever you feel socially, theologically responsible to do. But this stopped me in my tracks that Cain was married. I don't think I would have performed the ceremony, especially if I knew that Cain had some unresolved anger issues. Now, I'm not saying that that's the only issue that should draw one's attention, but it points out, because we don't know about his wife's issues that have been unresolved, either. Ah, modern day connection. Any couple who seeks to get married, and I know this on the basis of the evidence of all the couples who are married or who have been married, there are always unresolved issues. First of all, they're issues because we come from families of issues you're not exempt from that. I'm reminded, I'm reminded of a story of a little boy, second grader, named Taekwon. Taekwon was given a homework assignment to write his autobiography, and the homework assignment was to write the first chapter, Where You Came From. Excitedly, he hurried home, he opened the door, his grandmother was there, and he asked her, Grandma, where did I come from? We're writing our autobiography in school, and the first chapter's homework assignment is, where did I come from? So where did I come from? And, you know, Grandma was one of those grandmas, you know, old school. I'm not having that conversation with you. That's for your parents to discuss with you. I'm not going to say a whole lot. She says, Taekwon, uh, the stork brought you from the cabbage patch. She saw his eyes light up, and a question well up, about to emerge from his lips, and before he could utter it, she says, and yes, 
Your parents came from the cabbage patch and they were delivered by the stork too. His eyes got even wider, wider. He got excited and she knew exactly what that question was gonna be. So she cuts him off and says, and yes, I came from the cabbage patch. I was delivered by the stork to my family too. He says, oh wow, thanks grandma. He goes back to his room, sits at his desk, takes out his tablet and he writes, just as I suspected, there hasn't been a normal birth in this family in more than three generations. Yeah, Taekwon is not the only person who comes from a family, who comes from a family, who comes from a family that has difficulties, imperfections, unresolved issues, issues that have been resolved but just never spoken about. And the truth of the matter is, like Taekwon, you and I are products of imperfect families of origin. And we have some issues that need to be resolved and addressed no matter what it is. And okay, if you're the spouse who looks in the mirror and says, gee, I'm perfect. Pastor's not giving a teaching about me um, here's what you do. Glad you tuned in. Ask your spouse what your imperfections are. And uh, you'll be amazed that they can find at least one. I guarantee you. Cain gets married. And we know his issue. Now, we don't know his wife's issue. We don't even know her name. We only know that she's married to Cain and she has a little boy named Enosh. And Cain names the city after their son. But does she know about Cain? Let's back into this. Will, will you allow me to do that for a few minutes? Cain's parents were perfect. I mean, physically, there has never been a specimen of humankind as perfect as they were. I mean, they were both well-proportioned. Well, I mean, they were muscular, healthy, strong. I mean, they didn't have any issues. Physically, perfection. They started out from their honeymoon into, you know, the first few years of their wedded bliss, and it was bliss, in a paradise developed an architect. The architect was God, and it was developed by God, and it was furnished by God, and all they had to do was to, uh, you know, maintain it. I don't even think it was called toil. It was just, you know, that was their job. That was their assignment. I mean, they were both fashioned by God with God's own hands. So they were pretty awesome by today's standard. But they reflect an issue, even with a couple that actually walked with God in their house. I mean, Adam named everything, but where did he learn the words and the vocabulary so that he could name all the animals? Well, God had to teach him. And Eve was formed from his rib, his side. Adam was knocked out by divine anesthesia. And he was asleep, and I'm sure God was taking her around, all that God had created, giving her the same lessons, the same instructions. She knew just as much about God as Adam did when God woke Adam up. And because God had done such a great job teaching Adam vocabulary, he says, whoa, man, there you got it. And he re realizes this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She comes from him. She comes from his side, near his heart. Oh, yeah, all of the symbolism. How romantic. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I mean, Adam. But Adam learned all that from God. Adam was smooth. But the difficulty came because they forgot that you can ask God questions. I mean, they were a couple who both knew God very well. Clear. But the serpent gave some misinformation to them.
I know, you thought that the serpent got Eve off in a corner somewhere. The Bible never suggests that Adam and Eve were ever apart because there was no need. They were attached literally from their side. So yeah, Adam was probably there visiting in. He doesn't say anything and no one suggested, let's go to God. Because the serpent is saying one thing and that's what God told us. And we got a question. Is the serpent correct? I mean, imagine what would have happened if they had gone to God and said, God, clarify this. Is what the serpent said true? You don't want us to be as smart as you. That's why I guarantee God would have answered their question. They would have obeyed God, I guess. Because in today's world, particularly with couples, with any relationship, you must be able to connect to God, and hopefully you can connect to God together. No matter what you hear, no matter how good it sounds, no matter how upset it makes you to hear what they say, what God says, I want to encourage you and remind us, you can always go to God together and ask God about what God has instructed you to do through the revealed word versus what you're hearing. I guarantee it might keep you in your paradise just at least until the next occasion, the next challenge, the next threat, and there will be. But Adam and Eve demonstrate to us what happens. I mean, imagine they were evicted from their palatial paradise developed by God for them to enjoy a forced out, evicted, bankruptcy, no assets. Now they must toil the rest of their days. They discover something because the writer of Genesis says the same thing. And Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore a son. And they have these boys. If you think about it later on, you'll discover that in the narrative of Genesis, Eve is the only woman in the house. Three males, her husband, her two boys, Cain and Abel. I wonder how that worked out. That's another sermon. But the key is, did Cain's anger issues start in their home, around their dinner table? I mean, the fact that perhaps scripture suggests that he was jealous of the affirmation that God seems to give to Abel and not to Cain that causes Cain to fly off the handle and be enraged with fury, so much so that he kills his brother Abel. Could it have been that there was some kind of display of lopsided affirmation of one child over the other? His issues had to come from someplace, I don't know. But Cain, who kills his brother in an outburst of anger, gets married. What happens in that household? Hmm. Scripture doesn't give us a lot of insight. Scripture does suggest by verse 17, that they didn't always struggle with their imperfections and they did find common ground and they found that which made them, yeah, perfect couple that made marriage great for them. That's gonna be another sermon too. But what about the times when their imperfections and their issues that had never been addressed surfaced in their marriage. Let me tell you why the church is here. The church is here to help us through the imperfections that we have. I'm not talking about, you know, the church with the usher, the members in the pew, the ministers, the deacons, the trustees. No, no, the choir. No, 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 no. No, I'm talking about believers who take the Bible as their guide their roadmap for life and living 
in a manner to discern through the Holy Spirit how they're to live? Well, the first one is make sure you walk people through the unresolved issues that you know they have, especially as they think about making a lifelong commitment in marriage to someone else. That's what you can do as their best friend, their pastor, their parent, their sibling, their cousin, their coworker, their friend since kindergarten. Because if they think that the pageantry of their ceremony and the creativity infused in that is enough to sustain effective, healthy marriage. Sadly, that won't do. No. Too many people struggle, and the story is reflected very clearly. Cain's story and his marriage, we don't know a whole lot about. We can assume that they stayed together all those years, had a home, and went through the normal struggles and the tugs of war, but that wasn't the case for you. And I don't want you to think that the church was not there. The church perhaps forgot to tell you or felt it was too sensitive, too delicate to tell you that before you merge your personal enterprise, your personal corporation, your brand with another person, that there's some unaddressed, unresolved issues. And it's not a bad thing, everyone, all of us have them. But if we ignore them and don't treat them, okay, maybe I'm not even aware of what my issues are, but you've seen them, you know me, then you owe that to the person you love and care about to help them. Well, maybe you discovered after you got married that both of you have some unresolved issues. I want to tell you that Adam and Eve give us a great example. They could have walked off, left each other, but scripture does not suggest that even after they endure the death of their child Abel and the banishment, the exile of their other son Cain and grandchildren that presumably they may never see, here again, this perfect couple, Adam and Eve, I mean, handcrafted by God, who experienced economic downturn, who now have to struggle physically, emotionally, and now this death, in fact, that's one of the first instances where death is recorded to have happened. They never encountered death before. But then it says it again. I can't wait to deal with that in another teaching. And Adam knew his wife. There was a lot of knowing going on in Genesis. And she conceived and bore a son, Seth. No, no, I want you to be clear. They're not replacing Abel or Cain. It suggests that somehow they found what was necessary to overcome even this new hurdle, the death, the tragic death of one son and the tragic loss of another son to reconnect and to recommit as that couple whom God had pronounced, even with their issues. My suspicion, Cain worked through his anger issues. I suspect that because he names the city after his son, whom they name Enosh. I want to remind us that the church is here for imperfect people. The church is a place occupied by imperfect people. When this church building fills back up, imperfect people, most of us with unresolved issues, will reoccupy these pews and the pews wherever you are. But the good news is, with God who created us, 
and with those of us who've been entrusted and given the Bible. We have a roadmap that our issues can be resolved, that that which God has joined together can at least make it through this crisis. And yeah, when you get through this crisis, there, there's always another one. But we trust God to get us through and to bring the happier moments. And there will be happy times to every crisis. My friend, I want you to think of someone, you know their struggles, you know their unresolved issues, and they're married or they're about to get married. I want you to pray for them, that it will be revealed to them, even if you have to be the revelator. But I know you don't want to get involved but don't let them think when they discover imperfections that they somehow made the wrong decision, that they shouldn't have done it. No, if they're a person that you care about, a person of faith, then show them. Yeah, with God, the Proverbs says, all things are possible. The Proverbs writer says that uh, if God is third chord between two other chords, there's strength, there is strength. And I want to tell you, just in case your church forgot to tell you, even with our unresolved issues, even as we come together from families of origin that are less than perfect, our imperfections do not have to hinder us from a joyous life together in family as God intended. And that when we have difficulties and discover the imperfections, we have a God who will work with us that we might become better. Our Lord and our God, I ask for courage for that relative, that confidant, that officiant, that church member as they are brought in to share their thoughts and feelings with the person they love, that you'll give them the resources, how to say and how to respond to a person who needs to think about something before they make an important first step. And for those who struggle and think that the church is the last community to be of help, Please, O oh God, let them know that even through our imperfections, our imperfections of eternal proportion, that you've given us a savior, an ultimate savior, so that our imperfections never ever have to mean a death that's permanent to our souls, to our homes, the relationships that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.
if this worship experience has been a blessing to you, then we invite you to share with us by giving a generous donation that we might continue to keep the gospel message spread to everywhere, especially where you are. You can text us at 73256 and key in the message GBC Give. If you'd like prayer or if you'd like to talk more about how you can strengthen your faith and your walk with Jesus Christ, then we invite you to call us at 804-895-0213. Until next time, beloved, go in peace.